Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Oscar Turan. I'm the director of the Dream Center here at UCI, where we serve undocumented students on campus. And I have the pleasure of starting off our evening tonight and introducing our keynote speaker. And we're here tonight to talk about resistance and resilience through art. But what is it exactly that we're resisting? We are resisting a system that currently would separate mothers from their children at our border. A system that would rank human worth based upon the country that you happen to be born in or the color of your skin. A system that would criminalize the desire to have a better life. In short, a broken and inhumane immigration system. And in that resistance, art offers a powerful opportunity to cultivate resilience. Art offers the opportunity to imagine new possibilities and new worlds, to express deeply held or secret feelings, and to make visible the often invisible or ignored. And in that effort of using art as a tool to cultivate resistance and resilience, we have the pleasure of being joined by one of the leaders of that, and that is the poet and artist Yosimar Reyes. Yosimar is a uh, poet that was born in Guerrero, Mexico, but raised in San Jose here in California. He is a renowned author, uh, published author of works, including For Colored Boys Who Speak Softly. He currently serves as an artist in residence with Define American, a media and cultural organization advocating for immigrant rights in the United States. And he has spoken at some really prestigious places, including UCI, but other universities such as Stanford, UCLA, and Princeton. So we're really, really fortunate to have him here in our midst tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to bring Yosimar up so we can hear from him. It's about to get real, like, motivational speaker in here. Uh, <laughs> uh, buenas tardes a todos. My name is Yosimar Reyes. I'm so excited to be here. Um, it's my first time uh, on your campus. It's hella, it's hella big. Um, so I'm sure you get a lot of exercise between classes. Um, my name is Yosima Reyes again. I don't know if you could tell, but I'm undocumented and stuff. Uh, I always let, I like to tell people if you've never seen what an undocumented person looks like, this is what we look like. Uh, we like to wear Jordans. We like to, you know, be, we're just as regular as anybody else. Um, I happen to be a writer um, and a storyteller and a poet. Um, and so I would like to start this presentation with a poem, if that's cool with y'all. That way you know, like, okay, he's legit. You know, they didn't just get anybody up in here, you know. Um, <laughs> So this poem's titled, Lo Que Soy. It goes like this. This is my nature. The truth in my heart, the breath in my lungs. Yo soy the one you fear, the one that got away. So el único que se te fue. Yo soy el hijo que nunca será padre, el nieto que nunca será husband. I am the near and the far of earth and sky, el sol y la luna. So everything that is in between, entre el hombre y la mujer. Soy el ser que por tu ignorancia no quieres reconocer. I am the one you define with hate. The one that doesn't fit your labels but manages to reclaim his name. Yo soy dualidad. Y aunque digas que esta es la misma canción, el mismo poema, te repito que nosotros seguimos hablando de compasión. Yo soy de fuego y tierra, de mares que liberan, de muertes silenciosas. Yo soy la muerte que me deseas. I'm of destruction and reparations, of freedom in cages. I'm the bird that still sings praises. Y con todas mis fuerzas te digo que tu odio me libera, porque más que espíritu enjaulado, yo soy el poder de la conciencia. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Some of you are like, what does that mean, you know? But you know, context clues, you get it. <laughs> uh, so I want to, I, I, I've been, you know, I've been really blessed right now that I've been able to take these conversations across the country. Um, and you know, for an undocumented person, I think that's that's really big. Some of my citizen friends, I'm like, damn, you travel more than citizens. I'm like, yeah, girl, try it. Um, <laughs> so I titled this presentation, "We Have Never Needed Documents to Thrive." Um, and these two old folks that you see right here, that's my grandmother and my grandfather. Um, and they're the ones that carried me across the border when I was three years old. Um, and they're the ones that kind of nurtured me in this country um, to become the poet and the writer that I am today. Um, so I always like to give props to, to my abuelitos because you know I carry them with me everywhere. Um, so I'll get started with the presentation. So basically, uh, I, it's, I'll give you a really a run through of like how, I, how I became the person that I am now, because I feel like that's something that I'm trying to investigate. Like, how did, how did I, as an undocumented person, manage to, to do that? Um, so um, this is me being cute. Um, so this is uh, US Citizenship and Immigration Services. So um, 
when DACA was announced, if you don't know what DACA is, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which is basically an executive order signed by Obama that grants me the authorization to work for two years and protects me from deportation. It's not a status. It's not, not mean that I get citizenship. Basically, I pay the government $500 every two years for them to not deport me. So I'm actually creating jobs for citizens, right? Um, so. <laughs> I went to the uh, to immigration and I was like, yo, I have to match with the emblem, you know? So I coordinated my outfit um, and decided to take a picture in front of it because I thought it was such a monumental moment of me actually for the first time stepping into this, this place that a lot of people told me that I couldn't go to. Um, and that's what I have now, I have DACA. I, I've had it for about four years. I'm a, um, I just got renewed. I think mine goes through September 2019. Um, and if you know anything about the news, uh, with the, what's happening with DACA, it's like a whole drama. It's like some, like, you know, they'd be like, oh, we're giving it to you. And they're like, oh, no, we're taking it away. Like, no, we're going to give it to you again. No, no, we're taking it away. To undocumented people are like, I just don't give me nothing. Like, I'm tired, you know? I don't want nothing no more. Um, so in 1998, the Aztec gods came together and the cosmos collided and then I was made. Uh, so, you know, I always like to, uh, like to tell people that I'm like a, a mythical manifestation of something greater. Um, so in 1998, I was born. I was born in the state of Guerrero, Mexico, which is really, really way down there, southern Mexico. I like to tell people that's why I'm cute, short, and dark, um, because we're, Guerrero is a big indigenous state. Um, I, and, you know, because of col col colonization and whatnot, um, Mexico is really anti-indigenous, but I feel like I want to take pride and on ownership of the fact that I come from a really, really powerful state uh, 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 of people who are, who are creating change. Um, this photograph that you're seeing right now, um, that's me when I was five years old and my older brother and my two younger siblings. And this is portrait, I'd like to tell, tell people that this is like the first portrait that I have saw of like a mixed status family, right? Um, and in, in the mixed status family is basically a family that uh, someone's undocumented and someone has citizenship. My two sisters were born in the United States. Me and my brother are undocumented from Mexico and we kind of navigated the same household and that presented different opportunities for each and each one of us um, so that's that's my my family um, a lot of times I do interviews right now I think there's a huge fascination with undocumented people we're all over the news um, everybody knows what a dreamer looks like everybody knows what who dreamers are um, there's language that we have, that the American population has already kind of adapted regarding I'm undocumented people people know what DACA is when you have Kim Kardashian T uh, tweeting like save DACA then you know we made it you know like oh we made it and Ellen wearing shirts that we're dreamers like now they're in American consciousness before I think there was a people didn't know what we who we were what we looked like where we're from and I think now there's a huge understanding of what that is but what comes with that is also this idea of what that um, undocumented people are this monolithic I this uh, monolithic story and I think that's what I as a writer am trying to push up against um, a lot of times I do interviews uh, with big major outlets and I think right now what we're seeing the, the way that I'm analyzing what's happening currently in our political system or in our in our pop culture is like before they used to say that sex sells if you wanted to sell something lotions or whatever you 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 you, you add a sex appeal to it but now what we're currently seeing with the trends of social movements that are happening what's selling right now is actually activism so if you the more woke you look like the more uh, vile you more down you look like the more uh, you know there's a cultural capital to looking like that and I feel like that's right now what's happening with the dreamer narrative is that a lot of people are like yeah I support dreamers but there's a certain cultural capital that comes with that um, so I'm really uh, fascinated about that that a lot of companies and a lot of major outlets are like yeah I want to work a, I want to work a project with dreamers um, and then they invite me to do that and then they ask me questions, especially videos, ask me questions of like, how did you cross the border? And bruh, like I told people I came from when I was three years old, it's not that exciting. Like I just opened my eyes and I was here. Like, you know, there's nothing, I don't remember. There's no, there's no kind of, I have no recollection of it. That, and I think I tell, them, I tell people that my first memory when I was young, it's reading the Clifford, the big red dog. Like that's the first thing I remember. That's how American I am. And I just wonder like, why is this? God so damn, dog so damn big, you know? Um, that's the first thing I remember. Other than that, there's nothing there. But I think for me, what I found fascinating and what I struck by is like, why do people want me to tell that story? Because it's not mine, it's not my narrative. But I think there was a, uh, there was a sense that 
if I was able to capture like the, the, the struggle or that fear or like that uncertainty, that somehow that story would kind of create empathy within citizens. And I started seeing that the way that those stories are formulated and I was like, I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know if I want to showcase myself bleeding for someone to believe that I'm a human being and because I'm a human being, I should be treated in a decent way, right? Um, so fast forward to 1991, we crossed the border. I asked my grandma how we crossed. She, you know, she tells me a whole telenovela. I'm like, no, girl, just stay to the basics. You know, like, I don't need the whole Beowulf story, the epic novel about how we crossed the border. Um, I, we crossed the border, they, ca I, they, they carried me because I got tired of walking, um, she tells me. And then we landed, this is me. Um, that, the, that picture was taken the first year we, we, were in, uh, we landed in San Jose. We landed in Eastside San Jose. And we landed there because we already had a, uh, some people that we knew that were working there and they knew that we were going to get us jobs and whatnot. This is the other picture is me in third grade. Oh, I forgot to tell you that I'm also a little gay and stuff. Uh, so I'm navigating both of those things. So this is, I, tell, I joke with people that the, that third grade picture is what happens when you dress your little children in hyper masculine clothes and then they turn out like me trying to wear star outfits. Um, because, so these are my grandparents, and one of the things that I'm really proud of my grandparents is that because we didn't have access to kind of a social security number, they didn't have access to the language, they didn't have access, they were how to adapt to new culture, I think that was a whole mechanism. I think that's what happens to, to a lot of new immigrants. Um, and I think one of the things that we also don't talk about a lot of times with undocumented communities is that a lot of undocumented people are living before, below the poverty line. A lot of undocumented people are not here, uh, coming out here living middle class. They're really living in extreme poverty. And I think that was my story. And for the longest time, I've been, I was embarrassed to tell people that we didn't have money or that we were poor and whatnot. But one of the beautiful things that I also love about undocumented people is the way that we're resilient and the way that we're able to kind of have be entrepreneurs and create our own methods of survival. Um, when people tell us that we're actually stealing resources and stealing jobs, I'm like, bro, Google it. We don't qualify for none of those uh, services. Like that's something that's close to that. We don't qualify for that. Uh, we we can't get welfare, welfare or any of those benefits. So my grandma. Actually, she saw women recycling bottles and cans, and she asked her, why are you doing that? Um, the woman replied, because once I take this cart of bottles to the recycling center, they give me a check. So my grandma, being a boss girl that she is, decided that that was going to be her business. And growing up, they would get up from 6 in the morning, go through people's trash cans, and just um, just push these carts across, the, across the, our, our, um, uh, our neighborhood. And that was how we were able to make a living. That's my grandma and my grandpa. Um, and that was, and one of the also things that I think I hear a lot of people talk about undocumented people, specifically within these narratives, is like undocumented people are doing the jobs nobody wants. And I always, I always tell people that I really take offense to that because that means, you know, when you, when you one that makes this, this this idea that undocumented people only are doing one type of service, and two, like this idea that we're forced to do these jobs. And I think what I don't like is that. You know, these conditions, because we live in this country that the workers are not valued, where people don't believe in people paying people like uh, adequate wages, that people don't believe that people should be making $15 an hour when the cost of living is so high, creates conditions in which the workers get exploited. And I think when I hear people say undocumented people are doing the jobs nobody wants, for me what it does is takes away the agency of the undocumented person. Because that lady cleaning the house, the person cleaning those bathrooms, that um, person babysitting those kids, you know, those people, I can assure you, the farm workers picking those fruits, they're doing that job with the most respect and the most kind of like dignity there is. And I think when we tell, say, undocumented people don't do the, we're robbing them of that dignity. Because you can tell my grandma, you'll tell her, she's like, she's proud that she's able to kind of um, work for herself and she has to have to ask for nobody from not, for nothing. And I think we need to figure out a way to honor those that labor as well as opposed to discarding it as something that nobody wants. Um, the other question that I get asked is like, are you afraid? Uh, a lot of people are like, are, are you afraid? And I'm like, I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Like, what am I supposed to be scared of? Um, 
and, and I think that's I think that's the other thing that I'm working towards as a writer, like shifting away undocumented narratives from fear. Like I don't think our story should be based in fear. I think there's 11 million undocumented people in this country. That means there's 11 million stories that are still untapped, um, and that we're still getting cut into these models of uh, of what we should be like. And I think when people tell me if you're afraid, I'm like, mm, I'm not necessarily. I don't think I'm afraid. I think we should all be afraid, uh, first of all, because we're living under a, 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 pred a, a president that doesn't really believe in that we're we're human unless you are a rich white man. Um, but I think that's one of the things that I'm striving for as a poet. It's like really pushing away from undocumented people being tied in with fear. And I know it's really hard because uh, that's the narrative that we've been told for the past since we arrived. Um, but I'm really trying to remind people that undocumented people have existed way before Trump was president. And way before Trump was president, undocumented people have been facing xenophobic laws. If you look at California, we were only granted the access to have driver's licenses like the past five years. Like it's not something that's kind of been, you know, intrigued or embedded in our brains that undocumented people have rights. Um, enter 1994. Um, I'm actually writing a one-man show about when and, uh, it takes place in 1994. Um, in 1994, uh, if, I don't know if you recall um, his history. And actually, I think this law was actually something that was proposed in Orange County. Awkward. Uh, uh, the Prop 187. If you don't know what Prop 187 is, also like the Save Our State law, which was in the, in the 1994 ballot initiative that established a state-run citizenship screening system that prohibited illegal aliens from using non-emergent healthcare, public education, and other services in the state of California. So basically, Prop 187 said that any undocumented person was not allowed to kind of, um, and you can go. I, I'm actually using some of this research for my for my show. If you go look and look at Pete Wilson 1994 um, commercial you will see the same rhetoric that we that was used during the Trump administration and the same videos of all the undocumented people just hopping the border um, this is the same rhetoric and I think one of the things that I like to remind people uh, you know because we take pride in California being so liberal um, is that California was kind of like the birth of anti-immigrant sentiment out of this law we have seen so many replicated throughout Arizona throughout Texas um, these places that are really concerned assertive there are kind of taking the same model and in 1994 what I think about is like I look like this <laughs> so in 1994 this kid was a, a California's worst nightmare um, and I think that's what we're looking at right now especially with sessions that just announced that you know they would separate um, um, families from 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 the, their children from their parents if they got across the border like you know I I, I think a lot about about how ch migrant children have always been kind of the target but look at me now I'm out here doing the most, graduated from um, San Francisco State, and you know now doing public speaking and whatnot. So I think I think that's what definitely informed a, a lot of the work that I'm doing. 2006, I am in high school. Um, I am about to graduate, and then I don't I don't really know what I'm gonna do. And one of the good things, you know, for me, like what was interesting growing up, that I was always a bitter immigrant. I was always mad at everybody because I was like, ah. Oh. I can't believe I'm undocumented. This is so hard, you know? And I remember when I was 16, or every, you know, everybody knows is driving, they're getting driver's licenses and whatnot, and I would see my peers with their cars, and I'm walking or waiting for the 25. I'm like, oh, it's taking 45 minutes. I could have been to school already. And I would be like, oh, I hope they crash, you know? So I would have thoughts like that. <laughs> Even now, I feel like I, I, my friend's like, oh my god, I'm going to TJ for spring break. And I'm like, I hope they don't let you in, you know? <laughs> That's the kind of like how I've kind of been coping with stuff. So 2006, May 1st, um, 2006, May 1st, the Great American Boycott, if you remember that, is when everybody took to the streets. It was large mobilization of, of people. Um, San Jose was lit. We were taking, we, there was thousands of people just marching the Bay Area. Los Angeles has huge demonstrations. Um, and this was basically to advocate for a just immigration reform. And for a lot of people, like, what is immigration reform? It's like, are we going to legalize the 11 million? What does that necessarily mean? So immigration reform, well, this basically was a, a, a protest that really advocated more for a system. When people, when people are like, why don't you get to the back of the line? It's like, because there's no line. I think a lot of people forget that there's something called Google in which you can actually Google how things work instead of making assumptions that undocumented people are just here not Googling either. Um, 
I'm so hardcore. <laughs> and so that happened. Nothing really went through. We entered 2012, and I think that's when a new form of the Dream Act got reintroduced. I know you've heard of the Dream Act for so long. I'm so tired of it. I'm like, every year, it's just like, it's not going to happen, bro. Like, let it go. He's not coming back. Uh, move on to a new thing. Um, but now there's a cultural moment in which people actually know what dreamers look like. People know there's 11 million undocumented people. People know research. We've already seen so many documentaries, so many films. They've been introduced. And this is 2012, I think it was a cultural moment because now you can't really escape it. This is my boss, Jose Antonio, Varga, Jose Antonio Vargas, which I argue is one of the most um, predominant faces uh, uh, of the undocumented uh, movement. Um, and so he came, he's a, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, uh, working for, was working for the Washington Post and decided to come out as undocumented. And Time Magazine was all over it. Um, they put him on the cover of Time Magazine and all these other undocumented people. Um, and basically the, the conversation was like, what are we going to do with these people that have been living here? I like to joke around that when Jose Antonio came out as undocumented, he ended up on the cover of Time Magazine. When I came out as undocumented, nobody cared. Uh, so I'm bitter about that too. Uh, enter 2018. I think now there's a, definitely a cultural moment. We're living in this time in which people know who we are, in which people are like, yes, we're all dreamers. Let's do something for the dreamers. But it's interesting to me now because we, we talk about dreamers and we're like, these, these kids, these children, like, what are we going to do with these children? And I'm sitting there watching the TV. I'm like, bruh, I'm about to be 30 this year. Like, <laughs> that's how late this Dream Act thing has been, like, taking forever, you know? Like, it would have been cute when I was, like, you know, 16, 18, you know, I'm, even 21. I'd be like, yes, I'm still a child. But I'm about to be 30. And so I think it's, like, very interesting to see this kind of language in which, you know, like, now we're adults. And we've been waiting for all this time for something to happen, and it doesn't hap It hasn't happened. And sadly, right now, it's not looking too bright for us. But I think for me, when the work that I'm trying to do and the stories that I'm trying to tell, is trying to create a sense of narratives that are based on, uh, on joy, that give people kind of a mental break from everything that's happening. And every, every other day, um, I'm like, I'm, sometimes I look at the news, I'm like, damn, bro, what did we do so bad? Like, people just want to drag us left and right. Like, we just need a break. Can someone just give us a shout out somewhere? I'm like, yeah, doc shout out to all the undocumented people still surviving, you know? Like, I feel like that's what I, I, I want to do with my work because Every day there's, there's something else, and every day we're blamed for something. Um, when those California fires happened, don't, I don't know if you saw that someone came and was like, oh, it was an undocumented person that did that. I'm like, damn, we're out here starting fires that we didn't even start. Like, it's just like, can we just get a break? Um, but I think right now what I'm, um, it's, uh, this is also what I, I'm interested in, in, in media and journalism and the way that we're being represented, because there's this idea that undocumented people have kind of become a commodity. We've been commodified into thinking that somehow, if I tell you my story, if I tell you how hard my life is, if I tell you like the most tragic things that have happened to me because I'm documented, somehow that's going to make you the citizen who uh, go vote or it's going to make you want to hug me. And I'm not, I don't know if that's a trade off that I want to do. And I think one of the things that we're seeing right now, and that I always talk about, and that we're seeing right now, even with the elections, when, is this white anxiety that's happening into this country, in which we're, move, we're moving and realizing that, you know, the, 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 the fabric of this country does not, it's not white, and it's not white Americans. And we're moving and shifting this fabric, and out of that, all this anxiety is coming up. You go through your Facebook, and you see people calling the police on just a black person napping in the dorm room. You look, you know, like this kind of panic that's happening, like my country's changing, I don't know how, what to do with this. But what we're doing with undocumented narratives is that we're kind of making them super tragic to pacify that white anxiety, to be like, listen, no, they're not here to take your jobs, they're here like to pay the taxes, they're going to follow the laws, like just love them, you know? And I don't know if that's something that I'm interested in doing. So one of the, this is, I love this kind of, I took this from from Twitter, because it reads, California fruit will die on the vine after ice raids, labor warns. And I like the, the, how this person kind of put it into context. And he says, labor, headlines that happen with white Americans are most likely to empathize with fruit than brown people. 
And I think that's what we're fa up against right now. It's, I think the way that we're telling stories of undocumented people, you'll hear the stories of the overachieving um, student that got into an Ivy League school. Like, you know, you'll, the four-point student from Fresno that managed to get into Harvard. And I think that should be definitely something that should be celebrated and honored. But that's not all of us. And that's what is that, to, when you see, when you're only selling those stories, what is that telling to the average C student that also has a full-time job at McDonald's to help his family and can't keep up the grades and probably is going to community college? That's telling that their story is not as resilient, right? And the other fact, stories that we hear is a lot about taxes. Undocumented people pay this amount in taxes. And I think like when you put a, a, a monetary value to our lives and the fact that we're, we're, not, we're more viewed over how much money we contribute, which is billions of dollars that we into Social Security, we cannot claim. I think that's also something that I'm not interested in. And the other story is like labor. Like if undocumented people don't exist, who's going to wear your table? Who's going to be out here cleaning the, your toilet? And in my mind, it's like, you should do it yourself, you know, because I didn't migrate all this. I didn't migrate when I was three years old and face all this xenophobia and people telling me to go back to my country every day to clean your tables. That's not something I'm interested in. And I know I'm kind of hardcore, you know, but that's just me. Um, so what's next? I think right now we're all asked, we're asking this pitiful question of what's next? What's going to happen? And for me, I don't know. I think for me, I, I, I kind of tune out sometimes. I'm like, oh, I need to. You know, like when you have those moments and you're watching your news feed and you're like, I just need a meme. Like somebody just sent me a meme because I'm having one of those days where I'm just seeing all this stuff that's happening and nobody's taking action. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm at right now. Like I just want to make memes for undocumented people. I want to be a meme generator where people are just laughing and, 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 and allowing themselves to have moments of joy. And I think that's what kind of my stories and my poems are doing right now. Um, so um, yeah, because right now it doesn't, it doesn't look too bright. And I think one of the things that's, as Americans right now, you should need to be really aware of, what's happen of the way that immigration law is getting rewritten and restructured for it to mean that more black and brown immigrants are not welcome into this country. And we're seeing this with the travel ban. We're seeing this with the mass raids. We're seeing right now with the caravan that's in Tijuana. Like, it's, it's, it's a white supremacist agenda that's happening. And I think it's really important to really become aware that, that that's what's happening into the country. It's like, how do we not let more immigrants in because we want to make it wider? Um, so I didn't mean to scare you, you know, Amber Alert. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to read some of the stories that I'm writing. Um, is that cool with y'all? Yes. Okay, that was like, okay, we need to change the topic. Uh, <laughs> we probably heard to write poems, not to be out here scaring our people. Um, so I'm working on my one-man show. Um, uh, we're having a stage reading in July in downtown LA. Um, and basically the play is about growing up queer and undocumented in the hood um, because that's also like a, another thing that I, I definitely want to um, tap into, um, writing more about poverty and um, environment where undocumented people come from. Um, let me see. Perfect. Okay, so I told you I went to San Francisco State University. If you know anything about the Bay Area, that we're really super woke, too much wokeness. Um, we do the most. And so when I was in San Francisco, um, as, a, as someone that came from the hood, I had to learn all these language. I was an English major, so I had to learn all these language and all these theories. And I'm like, oh my god, I embody multiple dimensions of oppression. And because of that, that makes me special. Um, and so I learned all this language. And so when I was growing up, I feel like if you grow up poor, you know that like you recycle because not because you want to be green, but because you recycle, you know, <laughs> like well, we're going to reuse this a million times, you know, well, how much was that shirt? $30. You're going to wear it 30 times, you know, that's kind of my approach to shopping now. And so I had this neighbor, her name was Norberta, and she was like, uh, she was super cheap. Later I learned that it's not called cheap, it's called sustainability. Um, she was real sustainable. And so they put a Goodwill truck in front of our, our, house, our apartment complex because the idea was that all the undocumented people were going to shop at the Goodwill. But she was an innovator, an entrepreneur, a creative. She was like, listen, they leave that Goodwill truck outside at night and people just dump bags of clothes. We're going to go through, search through those bags and we're going to come up on all the good stuff and then sell it at the flea market. 
So she had a little army of little thieves like myself to help her. So this is called the Goodwill truck. There's a Goodwill truck down the street. Norberta tells us that at night people just leave bags of clothes outside to donate. No nice security, she says. She schemes this plan to gather all the neighborhood kids and walks us to the truck so we can help her find cute things she could potentially sell. Our payoff is that we get to find old toys and we get to be bad. Abuela, Abuela decides that she wants to join in on the fun, so as soon as it hits 9 o'clock, we all meet at the courtyard. She tells us the game plan. Okay, pay attention. You're going to walk down the street and you're going to search through the bags. Only take the things you need. Do not be greedy. We walk down the street, adrenaline, pump, adrenaline pumping because we're about to come up on some free bomb things. Once we get to the truck, it's like a gold mine. We can't believe people will donate all these things. There are all kinds of clothes, books, toys. We want to take it all, but we have to be smart. I asked my abuela, isn't this stealing? Well, no, because people donate these things for people like us. I continue searching through the plastic bags. All the, kids go for the, all the kids go for the toys, but I like books, and pick up a couple I can read when my abuela leaves me home alone. I turn around, and I see Norberta carrying a giant teddy bear. It's like those bears are hella hard to win at the carnival. All the kids are mad because she calls dips on the bear and decides she actually wants to take it home to decorate her living room. In defeat, we all turn back carrying the bags of things we picked up from the old truck. We have clothes, toys, shoes, books. As we're walking back, we hear a siren bleep. La policia! We scream when we make a run for it. We run like roaches when you turn the lights on, hiding behind cars, jumping into bushes, running past the street. Even my abuela runs. We turn back and we see Norberta's big body running, carrying the giant teddy bear. She won't let go of it, but it slows her down. Before we know it, the cop cart has a bright light shining on her. On the megaphone, the cop says, ma'am, please put the bear down. <laughs> Norberta doesn't really speak English, but she knows she's in trouble. She lowly places the big teddy bear on the cement, and then the cop walks toward her. She tells them, Ay, es que no sé inglés. Yo pensé que era gratis. <laughs> the cop leaves her with a warning, and we all watch Norberta as she walks back towards us, her face in defeat, and in a determined immigrant spirit, she tells us, Mañana vamos a encontrar otra troca. So that's my neighbor. She's cute. She's still around. Uh, I gotta change her name because she might sue me. Um, no, this is a work of fiction. Um, so with this show, what I'm trying to do is really showcase like a neighborhood because I grew up in a. Uh, so I grew up in an apartment complex with. Uh, Everybody was undocumented. So like when I came out as undocumented, I was like, bro, we know, you know, like it was like it was everybody was undocumented. Um, so I, what I love about my neighborhood is that we already had mechanisms of survival. So like people knew who would hire you, what companies would hire you. And when I grew up in the in the Bay Area, so a lot of the Bay Area were known for a lot of technology, Facebook, all that stuff, right? And I think I, I, what I find fun, or ironic about the Bay Area that we celebrate all these like you know. Um, young white men in tech that are you know, just like, I'm going to leave college and just follow my dreams. And then it's like all the undocumented people actually making things happen. Because that was my first job. My first job was in an assembly line. And I used to assemble ATM machines, like polishing them for eight hours, bruh. Just like, ugh. And you know me, as a, I've always been really high maintenance. So I was like, oh my god, I hope they fire me. I hope they fire me from this. And they wouldn't fire me. They would fire the señoras that really wanted the job. Like, no lady, take my job. I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. Uh, but they, because I spoke English, and all the señoras like, you speak English. You're going to do good things. And I'm like, I, don't, I just know how to like talk mess like I don't know what I'm gonna do um, so eventually I, I decided they fired me thank God because I would like I would put the stickers but I put them crooked that would just like a fire and be like oh I'm not good at this job so they finally did fire me thank God um, and I decided like that's not the job that I want to do I want to become a writer and I want to talk and I felt like my family was super funny because they were just so dramatic all the telenovelas that we watch like, I want to write them because I feel like there's so many characters. So I went to school at San Francisco State, and I was like, you know, I could major in ethnic studies. I can do Chicano studies. But like, no, I want to do English because I feel like English is powerful. Stories are powerful. And if I did English, then more people would see, feel themselves reflected in these stories. Um, and then I would write these stories about my grandma recycling bottles and cans. And it was interesting because the English department is, you know, everybody's white. It was pretty white. And I would submit these stories, and I would be like, oh, my god, your characters are so colorful. I'm like, yeah, they're Mexicans. Um, <laughs> but they couldn't believe, like, how did you make up a character recycles bottles and cans? I'm like, 
because <laughs> it's my grandma, you know, like, <laughs> it's not a character, like, it's, big. so I think one of the beautiful things about growing poor, growing up poor and with so much trauma is that you don't really have to travel to find a story, you just gotta sit in your mirror and look at yourself and be like, oh, where did I get this scar from, like, oh, I know now, like, it's that one, let me write that story about this scar, um, so I'm gonna share a couple of more stories from this one man shows called Prieto, so it's a, uh, uh, um, that I'm writing, it goes like this, Gordo, gordo, Yosimar, Yosimar, ven a comer. You hear that? That's my grandmother. She thinks we're still in Mexico, so she has this really bad habit of running to the porch of our apartment complex and shutting out for me. And it's not bad that she still thinks we're in the open fields of Guerrero. What's bad is that she's calling me by my nickname, Gordo, which translates to fat. Doesn't she know that out in the streets you need to be respected? What's also bad is that my actual name is Yosimar. Why couldn't they name me something more boyish like Juan or Pedro? Everybody thinks they name me after la novela Marimar, so they all run around shouting the shun of the novela. Yosimar, ow, costeñita soy. Anyway, this is my neighborhood. Picture it as a prison yard, a rectangle shape with apartments all around, each door facing towards the courtyard. Everyone here is Mexican. We mean, if we first moved in, it was mostly Samoans. But as Mexicans, we're like cucarachas. Once you see one, you know there's about to be a takeover. Luco's my neighbor. He's younger than me. But since his mom is from the state of Guerrero too, Abuela says I need to be friends with him. He's that kid that's always crying with mocos in his nose. His mom, Norberta, she's the vulgar lady of the neighborhood. When she can't find him, she runs to the porch like my abuela and shouts, Luco, hijo de siete mil vergas, donde estas? Which translates to, Luco, son of a thousand dicks, where are you? Whoever said Spanish was a romance language I clearly has not had a conversation with Norberta. Our favorite pastime in this neighborhood is playing cops and robbers. We all meet at the courtyard and we choose our teams. Zapatito blanco, zapatito azul, dime cuantos años tienes tu. Ocho. One, two, three, four, five, cinco, siete, ocho. We choose the cops and we choose the robbers. Of course nobody wants to be the cops because you know, fuck the police and whatnot. I get to be a robber and look with the cops. The cops count to 20 and the robbers speed off. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 20. I take my shoes and my socks off because once I heard my abuela say that in Mexico you don't really need shoes, they slow you down. I run across the parking lot, hiding my breath as to make noise. I, I, I the, hiding, hiding behind cars, slowing my breath as to not make noise. I see Lucas Mocos way before I see him. He spots me. I take off. I run into oncoming traffic. I hop a fence. Luco jumps the fence behind me. But before, as soon as we land on our feet, there's a cholo standing in front of us pointing a gun in our faces. Why are you jumping fences? I could have shot you. What are you doing? Sorry, man. We're just trying to play cops and robbers. Get out of here before I really shoot you. That's the thing about this neighborhood. You can't really have fun, cause the cholos always gotta kill it. Like literally kill it. <laughs> Lately, my abuela doesn't like to be out once the street lights come on, cause that's when she knows the cholos are gonna be out. I hate that. I get out of school at three, the street lights come out at six. It takes me about an hour to do my homework, so by the time I'm ready, I only have two hours to play. And it doesn't help that Las Noticias Univision 14 come out with a reminder to parents. Son las seis de la noche. ¿Usted sabe dónde están sus hijos? I swear, as soon as my abuela hears that announcement, it's like she remembers she has a grandson. So she runs to the balcony shouting, Gordo, Gordo, ven a comer. Dinner at our house is always the same thing. Arroz con frijoles y un pedazo de queso fresco. I tell abuela she should make spaghetti like other abuelas. But she says, Esas comidas no alimentan. Es pura sopa con tomate. Los frijoles dan la fuerza. The first time I ever tried spaghetti was at the church near my house. Honestly, I feel like that's the only reason we became Baptist and not Catholic like most Mexicans, because that was the first church that told us they would give us free food. And my abuela, loving free things, one, came, one day came home and said, vamos a ir a la iglesia el próximo domingo. Sunday arrives. Abuela puts me in a white button up and black slacks. She combs my hair with hella tres flores. My hair is so greasy, I have to avoid the sun because once the sun hits it, it feels like my hair is on fire. We get to the church. Abuela signs in. They tell us she needs to go to the adult side to hear the sermon and I need to go Bible study with the other mocosos. Tu ve para allá y cuidadito con que te portes mal. 
estamos en la casa de Dios y si haces algo malo, Dios me puede matar. The thing about my abuela is that she knows she is old, and because of it, she uses her age to get what she wants. Every time I get in trouble, she says, Me duele el corazón por todas las cosas que estás haciendo. Sabes que yo sufro de los nervios, y un día de esos me vas a matar. I walk into the children's Bible study. All around me, I see kids with suits and ties, girls with puffy dresses and ruffled socks, big moños on their hair. It's like a quinceañera, but for God. I take a seat at my desk, and the Bible lady hands me a coloring sheet with the sheet picture of Jesus with the cane and a lamb. I think to myself, but I'm dark. All these sheep are hella white. Does that mean I'm a black sheep? We sit through this boring Bible class, and over and over, the lady repeats how Jesus died on the cross for our sins. All right, I write, I get it, Jesus. You die so I could be good. Why you got to remind me all the time? What, you want a cookie or something? It's lunchtime, and that's when Jesus sends me spaghetti. Thank you, Jesus. At first, I don't know what it is. It looks like bloody guts, but once I try it, I love it. They even give us Kool-Aid. We don't really drink Kool-Aid at the house because Abuela says Tang is better for you. Ever since then, I always want to eat spaghetti, but my Abuela says that if I want to eat that, then I should wait till next Sunday. I guess it's her way of keeping me coming back to this stupid church. We came here when I was three. By here, I mean the United States. My abuela tells me how they had to carry me across the border but I got, when I got tired of walking. I wish I could remember, but I don't, can't trace anything back. I wonder when, when does one be, begin to remember the beginning of their life. My earliest memory is in kindergarten in Jimenez's class. I remember her last name because that's my last name on my dad's side, but my mom won't put that last name of any of my applications. I don't care because I like the name Reyes because it means kings, like royalty. The first day of kindergarten, mommy walks me to class. Josimar, tú vas a estar, no vas a estar llorando. Solo estás un par de horas y luego te voy a levantar y cuidadito con que la maestra que me, maestra me diga que andas de cabrón. Dude, what's up with Mexican parents and their verbal violence, though? We walk into the class. Buenos días, niños. Buenos días, niños. Good morning, kids. Buenos dias, Maestra Jimenez. Good morning, Miss Jimenez. Talk about long hours at school. This is a bilingual class, so they say everything in, in Spanish and right away repeat it in English. You basically get the same information twice. In the middle of the room, there's a pile of books. I go door directly to it and pick up a book with a big red dog. There's a little white girl on the cover, but who cares about her? The big red dog is bigger than the house and most of the buildings in the city. He's like this giant dog. Miss Jimenez asks, ¿Has oído de Clifford, el gran perro colorado? Have you heard of Clifford, the big red dog? No. No. Mommy sees I'm distracted, and she makes her way to the door. I see her from the corner of my eyes, but I don't cry or say anything. I focus on Clifford. Mommy, I know Mommy has more important things to worry about than me crying because I don't want to stay with strangers. Dirty. Mommy used to bathe us twice a day. She used to scrub the darker parts of our bodies as to wash away poverty. She would take out our piedra pomo and scrub our elbows and our knees. She scrubbed our little hands, took the dirt beneath our fingernails, and warned us to stay clean. She would often say, ¿Qué va a decir la gente? Esa mujer muy elegante y sus mocosos bien mugrosos. She would neatly part our hair, and when one of our stubborn little pelitos did not listen, she would place saliva in her hand and made it stay in place. She didn't want me to be like Tony, who always smelled like pee, whose mocos used to dry up under his nose. They used to call him Piojoso at school because you could either see the lights jumping like there was a party on his head. Más vale que no se te peguen esas costumbres. A ver, ven, que hueles a chivo. She would then run to the fridge, take out a limon and slice it in half. She would rub each half under my armpit. The burning sensation would make me scream, Estate quieto! She ironed my shirts, pants, underwear, and socks. Mommy, who was left alone to raise two brown boys, dark as dirt, made sure that the rest of the world never had an excuse to call us dirty. So that's a little kind of... Um, uh, ¿Cómo se dice? Summary of the show, I still am still like rewriting a lot of these scenes because you know, I, I am interviewing my, my mom. I'm like, oh, do you remember that? And she's like, no, I don't remember. <laughs> you know, good. But I remember, like, I was like, oh, mom, remember that one time you hit me? And she's like, I've never hit you in my life. <laughs> I'm like, no, you did with the cable from the fan. Like, no, don't be saying that. I've never done that. You know, te va a castigar Dios if you say that aloud. Um, 
So to finish this, uh, I would like to finish with a poem, and then we can. Then it's the the panel conversation that we have with some of the artists um, for for the art show. Um, and you know, like I've been really blessed with it. I feel like one of the things that I've been really blessed with in my work is that I've been able to do some really dope things. You know, and as an undocumented kid from the hood, like I wouldn't imagine these kind of opportunities arising for me. You know, when I was 19, I uh, I released my first book, which was for Color Boys Who Speak Softly. Um, and that, the birth of that book, and that was like, yeah, it was like almost 10 years ago, because I'm about to be 30 this year. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm old now, um, well, I'm an elder. Um, I released my first book, and out of that book, uh, that book came because I did a, a collaboration with Carlos Santana, um, the musician. Um, he saw me perform, and he's like, I want to work with you. Um, and, we, and, and I wrote a piece for, for his concert that year. And then he's like, I want to pay you. How much do I charge you? And I'm like, damn. How, what do you charge a billionaire? I'm like, I'm, I'm sure he's, he has a lot of money. So I'm like, what do I charge? But I told him I wanted a book. And out of that, that book came out. And uh, now I read it, I'm like, oh my god, this, this, this writing's so horrible. It's so tragic. I hate this book. But it's cool to look back because those are the thoughts when I was 16 through 19. And I think those are the thoughts of a queer, undocumented kid living in extreme poverty who managed was writing all these things there's one or two poems about these guys that i thought i was in love with I'm like oh my god how horrible wasting my pages on my first book on dudes you know she was really taylor swift before taylor swift um but this poem i wrote this poem that i'm going to read i i really love it because i i wrote it this i think i wrote this when i was 19 years old but i still use it a lot because it's still relevant and stuff that, that, the work that I'm doing. And the work that I'm doing right now is like, it's rooted in love in anything. The way I might sound, yesterday I did a presentation in, at the Oakland Museum and someone came up to me and was like, you're so harsh when you speak. I'm like, I think I'm funny. But I mean, for me, like the work that I, it's rooted in love. Like if anything, the way that I, I it's rooted in love and I'm striving to, when all this, this mess is happening, I still wanna maintain my dignity and I still wanna be proud of who I am as a queer and documented person, stay, take, take pride in that and stand tall in that. So that's why when people tell me like these little facts, or like you're just taking my jobs, I'm like, I'm not, I'm probably you're not qualified for the job that I have, so no, I can train you to get it, but no. Um, so this poem's, this poem's based on love. <laughs> this is a love poem, it's called My Revolutionary. It goes like this. You tell me you don't like the city, that these buildings, this concrete numbs the senses, cages the spirit, and baby, your spirit was meant to be free. Me, you, my love, were born to be revolutionary. Like the tobacco you offer to blow blessings free, like palabras sagradas que salen de tu boca, y las rimas femeninas y masculinas that you buzz here on stage. You are my revolutionary, not a guerrero, but a healer, because in times of conflict, mi rey, you heal. And more than body, I must agree with you that you are spirit, because more than your flesh, I'm in love con el corazón que tienes. You are the reason why I love men with noble hearts, the reason why I don't mind sharing a bed with someone. For men like you, I will ride a million barks, get lost in Oakland and find your house beneath the brightest star. Mi vida, you come from tierra. With the spirits of those who fell to cross over Rome, you come from el desierto, but baby, we all know you are not deserted. You got me, and together we are four spirits, like the four directions. You have the creator behind you. You're his creation, his masterpiece, and in this journey you are traveling, you have managed to leave your footprints in my heart. I carry your breath in my hair, your teachings in my two-spirit. You are fluid, como los ríos que nuestra gente ha cruzado. You remind me that the only possessions we have in this world are our bodies and our voice, and the combination of the two must be used to honor the spirits of the Pasados. This life is a ritual, and in its sacredness, I'm so glad I'm able to hug you. You are my revolutionary, and as you make your transition back home into the arms of your mother, into the lips of your father, I ask that you take a memory of me with you. I ask that you take this poem with you. Plant these in la tierra que te vio nacer, en esa tierra que ha sido bautizada con la sangre sagrada de nuestra gente, and I will assure you that wherever you be, this love will sprout in you. Como el sol por las mañanas, this poem will shine on you. Now go to wherever home is, knowing that in San Jose you leave a brown boy that has nothing but love and respect for you. In the meantime, I will stay here in this shitty city, in this cage, singing and singing till the system crumbles, to borders break, till the earth shakes and our people become awake. I will be here singing and singing until the day in which we are all free to return home. <laughs> Yeah, this second portion is basically a student panel discussing the artwork that you see in the back. Um, and I think this is, it's really amazing to have an all undocumented panel because I think like 
that's badass, you know. I feel like oftentimes <laughs> it's like, um, uh, I think that's, uh, it's really powerful that, uh, that there's a conversation happening amongst folks that are kind of experiencing everything that's currently happening and as peers and as people that are, you know, facing whatever, uh, whatever's happening right now. Um, I'll start off with reading their bios and then they can introduce themselves the way they want to because, I, you know, I want to like, um, I feel like I want to read your, your cute bios and stuff. So first off right here, we have Salmon Salvidal, who is a political science international studies major. He grew up in numerous cities across the grandeur of the Americas. Um, he draws inspiration from global and multicultural perspective. Um, and as a person recently introduced to art, uh, a painting not experienced as, since an early childhood, he began to paint through the Undocu Art Collective at the University of California, Irvine. Um, he has an undocumented student in, in the United States. Pen painting is a newly discovered type of language that can express the different perspectives that form, that form him as an individual. Um, next up, we have a bow tie who is an artist. Uh, activist and a senior at the University of California, Irvine. He migrated to the U.S. at the age of 13 in 2009 and has lived in his newfound home since then. In addition to advocating for immigrant rights, Bo writes poetry and creates artwork that reflects his reality and thoughts. Bo uses his art as healing process by, by expressing his emotions, ideology, identity, and stories. He is inspired by surrealist, surre surrealism, girl, this immigrant language, um, <laughs> graffiti, Thai art, and cultural folk art. Currently, Bo is working on his art collection and clothing line, which I got a t-shirt for. Thank you. Uh, um, and a book telling stories of undocumented Asian American Pacific Islanders in the U.S. And an app for undocumented individuals to find legal support. Okay, Bo is busy out here. He's an overachieving immigrant. Yes, we love it. Uh, next up, we have Andre, Andre Laguna Morales, uh, who is a first-year transfer student. What art has done to her is being able to express herself and the different identities beyond being undocumented, which I think is really amazing. Mm -hmm. Not only being able to liberate herself, but also to find and some, some clean with the identity that has shaped the person that she is today. Through art, through her art, serious through, she says, through my serious liberation, I've been able to express my emotions, but mostly mean able to showcase myself, stripping away from the narratives that aren't mine, me saving myself from madness and becoming my own happiness. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Alejandra, also known as Ali Jeronimo. Um, she's a second year anthropology and criminolo crim criminology law and society double major was born in Itacuaro, michoacan um and lived there until she was seven years old and grew up in la puente california shout out to people from la puente uh, mm -hmm. as an undocumented student she says i feel like art is a it's a never it's never the main focus of our lives and documented mm -hmm. students are encouraged to pursue careers that are viewed to be financial benefits beneficial which often leads art to be seen as an elective and nothing more i personally never really had the formal art education besides one class that i took in high school and as graduation requirement but i like to say i grew up surrounded by art at home at my home my dad is my greatest influence he works as an industrial painter and has always made sure there was paint cans and paint brushes in our house so please clap it up for our amazing <laughs> panelists um, <laughs> they're legit I'm so happy to be here uh, so one of the things so now that I, I officially introduce you with your amazing bios you know I think a lot of times <laughs> I get really awkward when people read my bio because like oh my god and you're just standing there but let me um, if you were to just uh, um, introduce yourself like who are you um, beyond uh, school and whatnot like wh who wh what would I if somebody would ask you who are you um, what would you answer we'll start that way since <laughs> you can pick it up okay. move it around I'm really sure um, I don't know, who am I? I feel like that's always a question you get asked when like, you go to interviews, so you're like, oh, describe yourself. Um, I'd always, I feel like when you ask who am I, I'd like to start with like, I'm a sister and I'm a daughter. Um, I don't know, I, 
I guess besides like the whole like when you come to school you're always asked like the basic three things your name major year mm -hmm. um, and I feel like the past two years I feel like that's what's defined me name major year <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know what else to add <laughs> besides name major year my hobbies I don't know I feel like the basic college hobbies watching Netflix mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, listening to music um, hanging out with my roommates um, which is like I get along with my roommates, which is kind of weird. Um, I know a lot of people don't. <laughs> I feel like this is too much information already. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Oh. Hi. Um, again, I'm Andrea. Um, describing myself, I don't know. I literally just did an essay like this for an internship. <laughs> like, describe yourself in 350 words. Um, no, honestly, uh, describing myself, I'm very diverse. I'm a daughter. I'm, I'm a sister. I'm a lover. I'm... I'm human, like I go through life, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a student, half the time I want to drop out, half the time it's like, no, I got to keep going. Um, I'm a discoverer, I'm a wanderer, I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm human. That's, awesome. Like, I, I go through those emotions and, you know, I guess that's the best way to describe myself at the moment. Great. You can use this one too, do oh, yeah. take this yeah. one, you know, that way you don't have to pass it around. Hello? Yeah, great. All right. Yeah. Um, it is hard though. Uh, um, <laughs> usually I just tell people I'm Bo because it's <laughs> such a simple name, you know? And then um, and it is hard. I, don't, I never really thought much about who I am as a person. Uh, I don't know, it's, it's hard to define yourself in a certain way, right? These are just all like bios, so you just mm. throw in buzzwords, you know? Yeah. Like These little identities that people want you to be. Um, but oh, I have I have this little cute quote that I kind of like, you know, like say who I am on my Instagram. You know, like on Instagram when y'all just have like those cute little description. Mm -hmm. So I used to put, I'm a traveling man, just converting his negatives to positives. So I think that's that's, that's okay. That's good. He got a whole <laughs> quote for who he is. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Solomon Vidal, also known as Sal. Um, that's a question that I haven't been able to answer until I came to university about six months ago, uh, really recently. And I'm still not sure if this is the right answer, but uh, as my bio uh, says, I'm a person who grew up in the southern part of Mexico, right on the border with Belize, where they speak English, uh, with the Mayan population, the indigenous population of Mexico speaks Mayan. A lot of them, you know, would use it as a primary language. And then Spanish, right, which is the uh, de facto or uh, lingua franca of Mexico. So. I would get sometimes uh, to communicate with people in Spanish, then English, and I would hang out with people that spoke Mayan. And one of the things you know that I really like is that we never saw you know like this racial divisions that I, later on in life I encounter. And common question that I would get you know whenever I'm at university to you as you know, oh, what are you you know like ethnically you know? And I always answer you know I'm just you know as we say in Spanish, mestizo. Like I'm a representation of all the races in one, all the languages because. Linguistically, I cannot deny, you know, one language and put it one before the other. Like, they form part of who I am and uh, really linguistic uh, perspective. But uh, that's always my answer. I'm a human being primarily before uh, anything, you know, before any nationality, before being undocumented. And that's what uh, we all have in common uh, as humans. Awesome. Um, and to start off, I know I was reading your bios and what I found really fascinating is that we all came to the U.S. in different ages. Can you remind us how old you were when you, remember, when you came to the United States? So I was seven years old when I came here. Um, you know what? I'm not sure. <laughs> I think I was five because I definitely started kinder. Okay. I started kinder in Mexico and then kinder here, so it was weird. Uh, I was 13. 13. I was about 10. So for me, what I find really fascinating is like memory, right? Like uh, what are the things that you do remember and the things that you don't? And a lot of times, for me, I came when I was three, so I absolutely have no memory. I just recently went back and advanced parole, but other than that, like I don't remember anything. Do any of you remember anything um, prior to the United States? I do actually have this one memory from Mexico. Um, so in Mexico, and especially in Etucuaro, Michoacán, it rains really hard sometimes, um, to the point where it hails. And I remember sitting outside like our front porch with my little sister and like our parents, and we had those like plastic cups, like the clear ones, and my sister and I were picking up the little rocks of hail. Um, <laughs> and like I remember that it was like, 
I remember it being really cold. So like whenever it hails here, which is never, um, it's really interesting because it just like takes me back and it reminds me of being back in Mexico, sitting on that front porch, picking up hail. Awesome. Anybody else? I do. I do remember. I remember. I remember certain things. Even though I was five, you know, when you're like younger and you have those selective memories, it's like, oh my God, was that a dream or did that really happen? But then you, you know, you get those stories from your cousins or your relatives, and it's like, no, that really did happen. So I have a lot of stories like where I'm like being a traviesa or like always getting into trouble. Or I remember in kinder, like I always got sent home because, like in Me in Mexico, especially in Guadalajara, because I grew up in Guadalajara, um, they have like a lot of little like festivals like it's always a birthday party so they always have a cake for someone or they're always like they have a pool so all the little kids go and play outside and I was always like falling in the water or like getting into trouble so I have like really good memories I guess <laughs> that's that's all my memory yeah. uh, I, I came at 13 so <laughs> I do remember a lot you know I think um I mean, I guess I'll just say highlights, right? Um, just remember going to the beach, you know, like Thailand is like a beautiful place. They have like waterfall, caves and all these things, street food, just people chilling, music, you know, friends, just memories with family, riding like low motorcycle. People don't really drive car because cars are super expensive over there. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, just pretty much the whole childhood growing up until 13. Mm -hmm. Well, one of my um, memories that uh, I remember the most, Pyramids of Chichen Itza. Okay, no. <laughs> uh, growing up, uh, my dad he used to work uh, for the government actually for uh, prosecuting uh, the drug gangs. So it was like a really dangerous job. Uh, one of my best memories from him in Mexico, I don't know if he was allowed to do this, but he got me into one of these military cars and uh, where they put the turret on top of the Hummer. I actually was there for like hours and they were like traveling all around Mexico and I would go to that top part of the uh, military uh, car. Um, it's, it was just amazing. It was like, yeah, I want to be in the military when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> I knew, and I, for me, like one of the things I, I, I really like to ask that question is because I, um, I meet a lot of undocumented people. I think one of the things that in our, in our rhetoric that we're trying to uh, convince people to kind of advocate for undocumented people is like they come from these horrible places. And I think it's very important to also acknowledge that, well, some of our memories are, you know, are not that negative, right? Like, yes, it's definitely very difficult, but there's still those moments in which you felt at least home or felt a sense that you belonged somewhere. Uh, my next question for you is, what is something your undocumented status has taught you? If it's taught you anything, what is something that being undocumented has taught you? Um, it's definitely taught me that there's always going to be obstacles. Um, it, just that label being an obstacle by itself. Um, but I mean, I've always never really seen my undocumented status as an obstacle. I've always seen it as something that was a part of me that I grew up with and it never really stopped me. And part of that was because like my parents never really said like, oh, you won't be able to do this because you're undocumented. They've always encouraged me to like go for whatever I've wanted to do. What being a document has taught me most importantly is one, um, it doesn't define you. Two, um, very diverse and how everyone has a very different experience, first of all. And not just because the being uh, undocumented, but just it has really pushed me to kind of view um, like the love for culture and language and understanding of other people and not just from a different ethnic group but from even my own like community um so that's that's something that has really been like the major focal point of what being a document has taught me uh it has taught me i think like two things one is like almost like acceptance you know i think it's just something i needed to come to terms with like for a long time, I was just like, oh, I want to not be undocumented to do this, to do that, la, la, la. But then now it's just like, okay, like, 
gonna be undocumented. Like it's cool. Like you know, people have done it. Like you say, and then people will continue to keep doing it. And then life is not defined by what you and you can or cannot do, but more so like how do you work around that and how do you take those life experiences in? And then I think I'm saying this is because like. I was getting really sad this year, like about to graduate, not having social security, still have my, you know, like my 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 parents, a couple family members in Thailand, and knowing that it's gonna be keep being like that, and yeah. then it's a conscious choice for me to choose to stay here. So it just you know taught me to just like you know if that's a choice I want to make, then it's just gonna keep being that way, mm-hmm. and then. You know, there's joys and there's life in different ways too. And then a lot of times that's what life is. You know, we all have our restrictions. But the thing it taught me was, um, I say acceptance, right? That the thing would just be value, like just to value like the time that I have, you know, just because this idea of going back to Thailand have always come back to me, come back up. And it's always been like, okay, fuck, I only have five weeks left in the U.S. <laughs> might as well just turn up. Might as well just hit up all these people yeah. and live life. So it's always been like that. So, yeah. so you know, right. it had time. Me. But also values, you know, relationship and people, not to take any of that for granted. I think for anything else, you know, undocumented folks, immigrants, we're, like, nice and kind as hell just because, mm-hmm. you know, we know what it's like. You know, it's like, you know, it's like that. It's true. That cheesy quote where they say, like, people have been hurt, like, they smile the most, you know? Mm -hmm. But I I really believe in that. Mm -hmm. For me, I would like to describe it as two uh, stages. And for me, the first stage was uh, a dehumanizing one because you always have these dreams. And when I was in high school uh, with uh, all these uh, other students that later on became my friends, I would see them applying to all these universities, to UCSD, uh, since I lived in San Diego for a long time. Uh, getting accepted and for me I got the opportunity to get accepted at another uh, educational institution but uh, I was never offered anything to attend that particular university just because I didn't have you know a social security number so for me that was a dehumanization stage where you know uh, you feel limited not because of you don't have the capability so you don't want to try just basically because you know something that you did not exactly decide to be born with um, but later on, I came to realize that being a document is a part of uh, myself, part of my identity, and I have learned to embrace it because without it, my life would have been entirely different. I have so many positive experiences with the friends that I've been able to meet, the influential people, uh, this particular institution even, and I'm really thankful for that now that and I think about it. You learn to transform something that people have a negative perception about into something positive, and that's been my uh, second experience with that. Thank you. And then uh, this next question for the people who might be asking or wondering, like, why don't you just become legal? What has been your kind of response to that question? Because I'm sure you probably answered it multiple times, and it's probably one of the most tiring questions that your whole existence that you're going to... But I'm interested, I'm always interested in, like, how other other undocumented people, like, answer that question, because I just go, like, really? (laughs) You know? So how do you answer that question? (laughs) Um, <laughs> it's actually pretty funny because, like, my friend and I always joke around, like, oh, we're going to marry a citizen. We're going to get papeles. Uh-huh. We're going to go get those papeles. Um, so, yeah, that's how we do it. We're, we're going to marry a citizen. We're going to get papeles. <laughs> <laughs> that's how we answer that question. <laughs> that's honestly a tough question for me. It's like, like... Most of the time, I'm like, I don't know, do you not know your laws? Both. <laughs> <laughs> that's, um, but a lot of that, que- because that question really does come up with like, oh, what are you going to do? You should go travel. Like, you should go do this. Like, why aren't you doing that? Like, why aren't you doing that? Like, why aren't you traveling? Why aren't you taking advantage of all this stuff? And it's like, <sighs> well, don't you know your laws? <laughs> like, um, so it, it just really depends how the conversation come up. Because even those conversations with like, oh, why don't you just get married? Why don't you do this? And I'm like... It's, it's, not, it's not a step that you can take lightly. Mm-hmm. It's not, it, there's, there's so many things that play into like becoming legal and people think it's just an easy step. It's like, no, mm-hmm. like I know people that have been in the process for like 20 years mm-hmm. and they're still on the wait time and they're still being telling like, no, no, no. So at the end of the day, like there's, there's so many things you could say, but you know, all you gotta, depending on who you're talking to, it's just like, well, just educate them. Like, that's what I do. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, I'm just kind of smiling because me and my friend, we make this joke, you know, people are like, oh, have you tried applying to this? Have you thought about that? Have you this? Have you that? And we're just like, man, have you thought about shutting the fuck up? <laughs> you know, like that's a joke we kind of have, but we never actually say it. But what I actually say to people is just like, look, like, I can't. Like, do you think I'll be living like this if I, if I have a choice not to? And I just, you know, just make them feel bad. Like, hey, why do y'all think they're fighting for this? Why do you think they're marching? Do you think people like to go march? Do you, you know? Yeah. It's cool. It's fun. Like, you feel the energy, but it's better that if the problem is not there in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's you. <laughs> Well, for me, always this is one of the decisions why uh, I decided to go for political science because uh, my family actually, due to my uh, father's job, they were always in constant danger of fighting these drug cartels, and the uh, war on drugs was not even as big uh, as it is currently, uh, due to the fact that up to a quarter of a million have uh, perished in Latin America, and a lot of people actually apply for uh, asylum in the U.S. and other countries, such as uh, countries in the EU. And they make it extremely complicated for you. Uh, you have basically to prove that your life is in danger, but how do you do that, you know? Like, do you just go to the drug cartels and tell them, oh, give me this paper, Dad, you know, this time the government that you're threatening in my life, you know, it doesn't work like that. So it is an extremely complicated system, but uh, it always comes down to the question. I mean, immigration is part of uh, human history. Uh, since what we know, we're always constantly migrating, so is migration a right? And I believe it is. Uh, mm -hmm. We all have the right to move to other places and explore. Awesome. Um, and I think one of the other things that I'm interested in now that I have all of you in this panel is like with everything that's happening, and I know I'm uh, everything that comes through your news feed, and I'm sure you're friends with a lot of woke people, so they're always reposting some article, like, oh, really, another article? Like, hey, have you seen this, Im seen this immigration article? Like, no, I don't want to see no more immigration yeah. articles, you know? <laughs> like, wh what are you, what methods are you, what are you taking to kind of not internalize that especially as students because i imagine you're like you're thinking ahead of your careers you're thinking of stuff that you want to do and plan for the future how do, what steps if any are you taking to not internalize everything that you see out in the media and the way that we're being portrayed um it does get really tiring like sometimes you're just like can we just stop like can we pause for a second and just like stop mm -hmm. um and I think that's really where like the Undocu Art Collective came to mind. Mm -hmm. um, it was created so we could have a safe space and we could like do art just to have fun. Like there is no like yeah we do have themes sometimes like oh we're gonna do this for an art show so this is a theme. Like if you want to do it you can do it. But it's usually just a place where we just do art and there's it's like a safe space to do your own thing. Like if you don't want to draw you don't have to draw. You can work on your music. You can work on other stuff. That's what you think is art. Um, so yeah, that's the Indocuart Collective has been like that way of like blocking out, or at least for a couple of hours, um, what's going on around us. I don't know. I've been doing. I've been doing a lot. I've been getting better at it because it is. It is hard. It is hard, especially um, because I'm not. It's not like I'm completely open about it in my social media, but I have posted about it. So I do get those people that's like, hey, have you seen this, have you seen that? And I do follow a lot of social media too. So what I, what I tend to do is like, I, I try to refrain from it, like I'll block off my phone, um, especially a lot with the recent artwork that we've been doing. Even though I named it the Liberation Series, like in my artwork, you don't see like a hand or, you know, you don't see the, the usual things that you'll see in like, like undocumented narrative like pictures so I've kind of been just focusing on what defines me um, besides the undocumented hmm. part besides that identity and that's where it comes to play where I'm trying to find all these identities because I'm like I'm over here trying to do life and trying to do school and then uh, I'm over here trying to get <laughs> trying to get my mom to understand like my I can't go <laughs> this home the um, home this weekend because I have like a test and you know and also trying to be a sister and then my friends are getting married and I'm over here you know I just got a relationship so I'm trying to get over that heartbreak so you know I'm just I'm trying to live just that normal life mm -hmm. that you know as possible as I can because it's not really normal but at the end of the day there's other kind of things that I need to focus my attention on mm -hmm. and so that's where kind of my focus to be able to kind of get away from quote-unquote reality of my real situation. 
Uh, if y'all know me, I've just been MIA straight up. <laughs> I've just been like, you know, like I don't, I don't use social media as much anymore. If I do, I just kind of post and I just disappear from it. I don't look at the comments, nothing. And um, you know, just art has been helpful, hanging out and almost like just remembering that part of me that yeah, I'm undocumented. Yeah, it sucks. It dictates a lot. <laughs> a lot of my work, all these things relate to it. But there's more than that, you know? There's more than that. And um, so that's just how I've been coping with it, just hanging out with friends, talking about different things, you know? Talk to them about happier thoughts, you know? Just what do y'all want to do? What do y'all do for fun, you know? Are we going to turn up this weekend or what, you know? <laughs> like, the race is going to keep it's happening. it's all about the turn up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, I just like to dance. <laughs> Uh, well, for me, uh, it was getting uh, into art through the Art Collective. Uh, thank you to my colleagues. Uh, thanks to my colleagues that introduced me to it. But uh, I wanted to uh, get into art as a juxtaposition to what the political uh, arena portrays about undocumented students. And that is, you know, portraying humans as statistics, as numbers. And they never show that particular emotional side. And one of the reasons I decided to go for painting rather than words is just uh, I think there is a limitation in every single art form. Uh, we usually think of language as the only way uh, based on what you hear and what you speak, but art to me goes beyond that. It's about what you see, you know, like explaining the color red in words. I mean, it's extremely difficult until you see it, right? And it is the same with art, you know, about feeling, uh, expressing, you know, uh, seeing not only limited to one particular time. Uh, and that's, you know, thanks to the art collective. So it is still a work in progress. Um, <laughs> I'm still looking for ways, other forms of uh, language for finding expressions for that. Great. And I think like I also think I think I like to remind people is like a lot of times like people think that you wake up every morning you're like, ah, oh, I'm undocumented today, yeah. you know? <laughs> and it's like, not really. I'm like, I wake up like, who the hell texted me last night, you know? <laughs> What's my tender looking like today? You know, I think I think that's also an important thing to kind of like acknowledge the fact that we're also complex human beings and it's not something that really leads our lives, right? I think you think about it when you're about to apply to something and like, ah, oh, I don't qualify or like stuff like that. But I think ultimately, I, 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 I like to debunk this idea that undocumented people are just like, we're not moving or we're paralyzed by this fear, right? Mm -hmm. And with these conversations of fear, um, oftentimes the narratives of undocumented immigrants are based on fear. So with reporters asking us all the time, like, uh, what are, are you scared or what are you afraid of? Or like, are you uncertain their DACA's gonna end? You know, I don't like to answer those questions. Like, why you gotta remind me, you know? <laughs> like, I was having a good day. You're like, your DACA's gonna end. What does that feel like? Like, oh. Uh, why you gotta remind me? So, in, uh, because I don't want to ask you that. Um, what is something that's bringing you joy right now? What's something that's bringing you a moment of joy? A moment of joy, like right now, right now, or in right general, now? like in general. In currently, yeah, in your life. Uh. Um, like I said before, like my roommates and I get along really well, so we have roommate dinners and we cook for each other. Um, so we'll like set up the table, we'll, we'll have like flowers on the table and we'll Aww. set it up all nice, <laughs> we'll take pictures of it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's what's bringing me joy right now, being surrounded by people who I love and yeah. Great. I mean, what, I don't know, a lot of things bring me to joy. I mean, I'm. I try to find, like, I strive for, like, peaceful moments and, like, mm -hmm. joy in everything. But what brings me joy is just being, living my life. Like, I'm, I'm in sports. I play rugby. I, mm -hmm. I've been working on my art and on my, my writing more. Um, I've been being surrounded by such wonderful people, my roommates, too, my family. I'm telling you, like, there's just so many things, like, that's, that are going on in my life. And I'm just, like, it keeps me going. Like, it's, it's been amazing. It brings me joy. I think I think what brings me joy is uh, is the people around me. You know, I've just really been grateful for everybody in my life lately. Um, just friends, people have supported me. You know, people I do art with, people I talk smack with, <laughs> and then you know, just just food and simple things in life. There's plenty. I mean, being here right now, like got a mic, some free food, you know, get to meet Yossi more. <laughs> we talk about how Dark Hour Collective is dope, you know? I mean, this all brings me joy, so it's cool. That's been good, and the weather's been nice. 
<laughs> well, for me, is um, being able to uh, hang out with my colleagues here at UCI uh, since I've been living here six months ago. And despite our differences you know, in citizenship, whether they're international students, whether I am documented, whether they're uh, US citizens and so on, so forth, from whichever country, whenever get to the political aspect of it, we just hang out as humans, as I said earlier, you know, like, like Bo said, you know, uh, we just enjoy the simple things, you know, and we find out we have more, uh, far more in common than we initially think. Initially, you know, you think like, oh, this person maybe is from Germany, maybe this person is from Russia. And we analyze that person based on that artificial identity created by the nation state. But, you know, it eliminates the individuality of that person. And getting to know each person individually as who they are as humans primarily, that's what, that's something that I've been uh, enjoying lately in life. Human connection. Um, and what is, so as art makers, what is your art, what is your process when creating your art? And what message are you looking to highlight uh, with your work? Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I feel like sometimes you just sit down and you have an idea and sometimes you're just like, what am I going to draw today? Like, um, I remember going like to our meetings and it's like, what do I do today? I'm just going to slap some paint on this paper and hope it, something turns up. But like, I don't really think there's a process to it. I think sometimes you just sit down and you just work on it. Um, I'm really into just like doodling, so like random patterns or anything. Um, so that's what I've been doing because it's something simple and you can repeat it. And when you don't have any, like no ideas to do or like anything like that inspires you at the moment, it's just something that to like pass the time, even like in class when you should be paying attention. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry, repeat the question. <laughs> um, what is your process within creating your artwork? And what new, uh, what new, um, what is something you want to highlight in your work? What messaging do you want to highlight within your work? Wow. Okay, um, well, the process to my art is, is really random. It's just, you know, depending, like, one moment I'll be feeling an emotion, like, you know, uh, I'll sometimes, in write, sometimes when you write something, it doesn't, it doesn't amplify as much. So I, I end up just starting to like um, to use paint, or sometimes a lot of most of the time I actually use colored pencils. And what my art for me at least depicts is who I am on the inside mm -hmm. that I tend to hide and not really let people know with words. Mm -hmm. So instead, I just used um, like my liberating series. Like I use a lot of like fantasy versus like um, reality kind of like feeling and hoping that they kind of just see this. Like a lot of a lot of the drawings, if you see them, it's like a girl, and it's like pretty much me depicting me and like how I'm feeling at the moment and how I'm trying to either liberate myself or how I'm just like daydreaming or just you know little things that I'm doing day by day. So that's pretty much my process. Oh, I got it. Thanks, bro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my process would be um, a lot of times when I do art, I don't think I've ever really done art without listening to music. You know, I kind of just like listen to music, just feel the vibe, just, you know. And then um, I doodle a lot. Most of my artists is pretty much doodling. It's just like I like to just free draw, kind of almost like free write. And then in the past, it has very been like therapeutic. You know, when I have a lot on my mind, it's just kind of like I just dive into this paper. I write random words that come to mind, draw random things that come to mind. And I tend to draw a lot of faces. And I think that sometimes might just be different emotions that a lot of times... This is me making stuff up, right? Because not making stuff up, but I'm not sure what it really means either, you know. Um, but I tend to draw a lot of faces, and I think maybe part of it is just is different emotions that I want to express, but sometimes I don't get to express in everyday living. Just, um, you know, and then uh, and the other thing, the, some messages that I try to put in there is just, it's a lot of introspection. It's just a lot of deep thoughts inside, and and yeah. And sometimes I have like premeditated thoughts, like okay, today I want to draw something about my family, about my ex, about <laughs> <laughs> about immigration, you know. And then okay, so those looks more well put together and organized. But most of the time, it's just all free, you know. It's just like if if there's so much work in life like at least give art to be just something that i could play with you know that's just like my my go-to uh for me usually it starts with a particular uh emotion that i might observe for myself and, uh, and others from my perspective 
And I try to think colors that could actually portray uh, that emotion. And then as I'm drawing you know, a portrait, which is what I've been trying to focus on, uh, then you discover that the humans, you know, what makes human consciousness is made out of this different, extremely complex emotions uh, contradicting each other, canceling each other. And that's what I try to portray, the complexity of uh, a single individual with all these multiple colors. So you'll see a lot of color on my uh, paintings. That's what I actually want to get. I do it on purpose in order to portray that conflict that each one of us has uh, in terms of what is our identity uh, beyond the politics, you know, also the emotion, the, the spiritual aspect uh, of every person. Awesome. And but I, right now, I feel like we've been hearing a lot in the mainstream news what undocumented people look like, who we are. Like I think we've been blowing up, right? Um, like I'm like I'm just waiting for somebody to write a soap opera about us. Um, within all this media coverage and everything that we we're kind of seeing, um, what do you feel are some narratives that are missing in the mainstream that we haven't really we have yet to see? Um, some storylines, whether it's like even personal, your own personal stories or something that you would personally, as someone that happens to be undocumented, would like to see. Um. There's always been this narrative of like undocumented immigrants, like young undocumented immigrants being, mm -hmm. quote unquote, the good immigrant. Mm -hmm. um, what I would really like to see is the focus on the parents because mm -hmm. they, aren't bad they made a decision to come here because they wanted what was best for their children and at the end of the day that doesn't make them bad that mm -hmm. just makes them human it just makes them want what's best for their kids they want they wanted their kids to have like a better opportunity than they would have gotten back in their home countries and what's being like portrayed in the media is them being seen as someone who's like stealing jobs or someone who's doing something that isn't what they are really doing. Like they're out there like trying, like fighting against everything, trying to find a job every day, like trying to do better for their kids. So that's what I would like to see. Something that, well like the, to see, not to see that portrayal of them. Because at the end of the day, they are our parents and we love them. And I don't think, I don't blame my parents for coming here. Great. You know, I've, I've thought about this. <laughs> I was like, but this is, this is where I thought about. I was like, imagine there's a show and there's like a family. Mm -hmm. And then, and then um, you know, they're just living their lives. They're going through obstacles, you know. There's, they hint clues here and there. It's like, oh, we can't do this. And it's like, okay. And then they find a way to do it. And then, you know, one sister goes to an Ivy League school. Another one, you know, she just wants to work. And then another one, this and that. And, you know, you're just... It's just a show about a family and how they, nav you know, how they navigate everyday normal life. Mm -hmm. And at the end, it's like, but they're undocumented. And that's it, the end. <laughs> and then people are like, they're undocumented? And it's like, yeah, they, everyday life is like that. Because honestly, yeah, I don't really, like, I don't really see myself in my stories because my own story and my own story of my family is very individual. And But there's a lot of things that I can see, like the cookie mom, like, you know, like she's, She's very, she's very like open-minded and crazy and you know like loud and but that's I I can see that in a lot of other people, and that's what I wish they can just really like highlight just because undocumented is it's just a word at the end mm -hmm. of the day, and seriously if the if a show would do that and just at the end be like yeah but they were undocumented and look they were still living everyday life they're still a normal family. Not all of them went to Ivy League school. Not all of them did this. Not, you know, the parents, you know, very loving, fighting, and this. It's just, it's like. Uh, I think right now in the media, like, there's a lot of, it's either soft stories for people to cry about, or just like, these are like people we need in America, all this American dream rhetoric. But um, first thing first, I think, it would be cool, you know, I think like I would want the media to be somewhat more diverse, like, you know, I'm Thai and like for Thai population, I, I don't think a lot of people expect this. I didn't even expect this, but <laughs> apparently, <laughs> apparently like 50% of uh, Thai folks here are undocumented. 
uh, I'm not sure if that's a good information or bad information, <laughs> depending if anybody here is conservative or there's eyes. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, but <laughs> it just becomes it's almost like a reality for like Thai folks, like you know, like they work in restaurant. Most likely they're all undocumented, and then most likely they're oppressed because of the wage and all these things. But uh, that aside, I think what I want to see is. And this, this is why I like Yosimar's project too. It's like this whole idea of undocu joy. It's just like, yes, like we need something, you know, to uplifting, maybe something about even, you know, like um, transcending. Because I think with me and seeing other undocumented folks in like um, in life and, you know, like my in like through my mentorship, through people I look up to is that they all motivated me because they all transcended their experience and their life and it is that's that's powerful and that doesn't need to always translate into success but how do people move on how do people heal with all these things i think that's that's one of the thing i want to see and um and just almost like the community aspect of it like the beauty in the struggle even mm -hmm. like we all have the struggle that bind us all together but that's powerful right like that's why we all go to march together that's probably why i learned how to dance some of like you know to other kinds of music <laughs> or like talk to folks that i might have not talked to you know but it's just it's just that beauty and almost like you know like like for Thai folks uh, at the temple, we have the kind of like swap meat selling Thai food and folks doing that. So, you know, it's just like those little hustle that people do, but it also puts some flavor and some stuff into here. Like, it's cool. <laughs> awesome. Uh, something that I would like to see on the media uh, is the elimination of this creation of artificial categories that they make that some type of immigrants are better than others. And ultimately, you know, they're all human. They all have the same rights, they all have the same intentions to thrive for their family, you know, for themselves, just want to be happy primarily, right? And uh, I see a lot of focus on us after so much time, which I think it's good, but also they should focus on other immigrants. For example, people under the TPS that are from Honduras, from Haiti, you know, also those people, they, 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 they uh, want to stay here, they want to uh, thrive, they want to keep on fighting for their families, and I think those people have been ignored a lot. And, being a refugee versus being a person under DACA or TPS doesn't make you any better than the other person just because of the status that they have given to you than a citizen uh, even. So I think the media should focus uh, on that, seeing those people as a whole rather than separating them into certain categories and portraying them as being better than others just because you have DACA or because you went to Harvard, you know, you're better than a person from Haiti or from Afghanistan that came here, you know, and could not get the same opportunities as you did. You ultimately, we're all humans. We all uh, want to live, basically. Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely. I think that right now there's, there's definitely, I think for me, like, what's interesting now is, like, I think we need to elevate and centralize actually undocumented creators. And I think that's why it's been important for y'all to continue doing the artwork that you're doing. Because, you know, sometimes as an undocumented person, you go to a museum, you're like, oh, this is a painting about immigration. You're like, an <laughs> undocumented person could have done that. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, how are you opening avenues for us? For us to not just be the subject of your story, but us to be the agents mm. and the ones that are creating that. I think mm. like I think that's where we're. I, what I would like to see is definitely, mm. if you want to make a documentary about an undocumented person, maybe you should teach them how to make it too, mm, yeah. so they can also start creating more work and 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 do that. Um, we're gonna open it up to questions in a bit. So if you have any questions that you're thinking of, um, and you're not too shy, you, you shouldn't be shy at all, because you know. Oh, we're, we're not mean. Um, um, <laughs> we'll open it up in a bit. Um, and oh, to keep it in a lighter note, I think I, um, um, based on questions that we've all constantly asked, what would you tell someone who claims that you are, you are taking their job? How, how would you respond to that? <laughs> um, well, I don't, I don't know how I would respond to that because like I'm currently looking for a job. So <laughs> I'd be like, well, we're in the same boat because like I'm looking for a job too. Let's That's look at each I other's would. resumes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to like switch? And look yeah, I don't know. That's how I would respond at the moment right now. <laughs> I don't know, it depends what job. <laughs> I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, it's like people are like, you guys are stealing your jobs. I'm like, well, what jobs? Like, what, what job in particular are you talking about? Because other than that, like, the job I want is I want to work with people, mostly nonprofits. A lot of people don't really care for nonprofits. They want to make money. I'm over here, like, wanting to volunteer my time. So at the end of the day, I'm not really looking for a job. Um. I mean, 
it can't even really work but uh <laughs> but uh but i would just i i might i might as well just point to you know like anybody within that vicinity and i was like look like he or she is stealing your jobs too i mean y'all make this like capitalistic society like everybody's gonna have, <laughs> everybody's you know like, what i mean like you know yeah. what you mean your job like they just put the poster up like <laughs> why me look at all these people around yeah so maybe i'll just i'll just point fingers you know <laughs> so it's, it's not me that person still <laughs> 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 I mean, uh, ultimately, whenever people tell me that, I, you know, it, it's a extremely hard question to answer. But ultimately, they're uh, putting a blame on us, uh, caused by a capitalistic system, which, when you think about capitalism, is competition. And unfortunately, one of the mistakes of capitalism is that dehumanizes people again, like makes you believe that you're better than the other person because you got a job or you're doing like a certain type of employment. And ultimately, I think we need to work all together in order to find like a common solution and make people work in things that they actually like. You know, like we will no longer, you know, have a society where, you know, oh, you're working on this because you stole it from me. No, you will be working on this because you like what you do. Uh, of course, it's going to be extremely hard to get there, but that's what we're here for, right? Yeah, I think like with all those rhetorics, I'm like, dude, really? Like, because I control the job market? Like, it's not. <laughs> I think I think within that I just make it I I like to point out like listen one of the things that I think with immigration that we do a lot is make make it a people problem where like these people are just coming and doing but we don't look at the systematic we don't look at the porn policies we don't look at laws that are being promoted that are displacing people you know people don't want to be mi migrants what makes migrants are wars what makes refugees are wars what makes people leave their homes are E economics and all that and I think that's the bigger kind of conversation that a lot of people are uncomfortable to have because it's very much easy to blame the person like it's you're the you're the flaw you're the reason why um, everything's going wrong um, do we have any questions anybody um, want to ask a question okay over there What was, I couldn't hear you, what was that what? What are your votes between voters in the countries? Your, I couldn't hear, okay. Your thoughts? Th yeah. um, borders? Sorry, um, borders? Your, our thoughts on borders in foreign countries? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think, well, I mean, uh, I think from the well answer, definitely, I think it's, the borders suck. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think what's happening right now, I think one of the horrible things that we look at within Mexico too right now is like looking how nationalistic we are. Mexicans love being Mexicans, you know? <laughs> but at the same time, it's like, um, we cannot be advocates for immigration if we don't know how to treat migrants in Mexico either. Mm -hmm. And I think you look at Central Americans and the way they've treated within our own system, I think it's horrible and I think yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know what it's... I think right now we're living in this time in which it's a, it's a global... It, there's a global crisis in which people are moving globally. Like, it's not just undocumented people here. Mm -hmm. If you look at, you know, refugees in mm -hmm. Europe, like, people are moving to these places that colonized them, that took displaced them. So I think, yeah, I, I'm all for the eradication of borders, but I don't know about y'all. Um, yeah, I think you said it best. Borders do suck. Um, <laughs> I mean, what's wrong with being able to travel to other places? Like, we can't travel, obviously, but like, if we could, we could just go back home and visit home. Our home home, I guess you could say, home home. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's a good political reason why borders <laughs> exist, and we can, we can really go like the boring way of like, why? But at the end of the day, like, what's fascinating is that no matter how much like boundaries are made and borders are made, what borders have taught us is that no matter what, that's not stopping us. That doesn't stop. That doesn't mm -hmm. stop human connection. That doesn't stop um, culture from traveling. That doesn't stop anyone. So I don't really know what to think of borders, but I don't see them as an obstacle. I mean, same note, you know, like, um, how do I say this politely? Yeah, border sucks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's one of, of those things, but, you know, it, it kind of, 
I think, you know, sometimes, like, for folks advocating for immigration, advocating for social justice, we, to other people, it looks like these ideas are more abstract. Because, you know, like, when I was first introduced to, like, these ideas, like, fuck borders, it's, you know, it was kind of abstract because you can't imagine it. But then now that, like, I'm really, like, um, thinking about it, yeah, like, fuck borders, just because, <laughs> um, you know, like, I think a lot of things in the world is just, like, people like man it's like man-made like people try to control this migration for this human flow that is going to happen that is natural that's just been happening for throughout all of our history and who created borders are the people who was in power right and then to their own benefit they take things from other places they make this whole globalization things happen and then now they just kind of said like okay this is where y'all can go this is where y'all can't go so that's why I think border sucks, and it also impacts people. These are lives, you know, people talk of it in terms of, like, you know, nation-state security, but what's nation-state really, you know? When you're not really caring about the people on the land yeah. or just people in general, you just care about this idea of land and protecting this land, but we, we clearly see that they don't really care about either the land or the people. Thank you. Um, if I may add to what uh, Yoshima said, um, I do agree, like borders actually are what uh, create part of uh, what we identify with. Uh, it's an artificial way of creating uh, identity for the people. And I think society should stop defining people based on what nationality or which borders they come from. Uh, they should, you know, treat that people based on what they can do, who they are, what their emotions, what they're feeling, you know, as humans primarily. So I think now uh, we live in a globalized society that despite this capacity of globalization through technology, we're still judging people or treating, mistreating people based on what nationality they are for. So we need to eliminate this perception that the nation state is what primarily dictates who you are as a person. Thank you so much for that. And we're um, going to wrap up in a bit because um, we want to um, y'all to check out um, the tables and check out the art. The artists are definitely going to be there. So if you want to continue the conversation with them, um, you can go ahead and do that. Um, and so we'll be around. Uh, with that being said, thank you so much for the Dream Center for having us and you narratives for putting this together and inviting these dynamic artists to, um, to be part of this panel. So muchas gracias. God bless America. <laughs> 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 Clap it up for the amazing panel.